Hi, people. Thanks. Thanks for coming uh, for this talk. Although there is a really cool talk about running Kubernetes on Raspberry Pi that's going on right now. That's where I would be if I weren't, weren't given my talk here. Uh, now that you're locked in, let's go through this talk. So uh, this talk was about chargeback. I don't know how many people uh, have already seen. Like We've given a bunch of talks about chargeback before. Uh, and uh, there's a, there's a lot of content about how we build chargeback and what you get out of chargeback. Uh, in this talk, we'll go a little bit deeper into um, what do we mean by multi-tenancy and how do we run our microservices or uh, how we run our fine-grained services and then what is, what is the one that connects in between. So the key, uh, key thing that I'm trying to uh, convey in this talk is about what, what is important in uh, thinking through about when you break down a service into fine-grained services, and what is required, uh, what is required for running a multi-tenant service that coexists with other multi-tenant services, and then uh, along the way we'll talk about uh, service identity, which is one of the key binding blocks between uh, running the service on a multi-tenant service. So. Um, and Twitter needs no introduction. Uh, it's a network of now. That's where you go to learn that your privacy is lost um, as of like two days back. So, uh, I mean, uh, Twitter is a platform. Uh, it's it's very open. Uh, people use it for multiple different reasons. Uh, and uh, we'll just go through a little bit of a history on Twitter to just give you a perspective of why we did all the infrastructure changes that we did uh, behind the scenes. So Twitter started off with a modest tweet from Jack saying he's setting up his Twitter account in March of 2006. By 2008, we saw uh, like um, unprecedented growth, uh, and then the platform was not able to scale up, and the famous fail whale term was invented on Twitter by a Twitter user. So we still kept building the platform. We optimized, and then uh, there was this tweet from Ellen, uh, the selfie from Oscar, which was like the most retweet, retweeted tweet. Of course, that didn't go without a glitch. And they followed through with a tweet saying they're sorry about that. But, and uh, the next biggest tweet was like one from uh, Brazil, Germany. There was like, uh, this had a, this had a, re a total tweet of 660,000 tweets per minute. Uh, somewhere around that range. I think the number here is wrong, but uh, it's there in our blog post where you can go check it out in terms of how how we did. And of course, this didn't go without a glitch. The, there are issues with that that we had to face. And we still kept improving the platform. And then I think towards uh, February of 2016, when Leonardo DiCaprio got his Oscar, finally, uh, I think uh, we had about 440,000 tweets per minute, and it went through like smooth that people externally didn't notice anything that was going on with Twitter. So what was going on under the hood when we were doing all, when the world was going through all, uh, all these changes in Twitter? So in February of 2010, we had this issue. And like any other application services, we went into optimizing uh, the heck out of the application, trying to get the maximum CPU, maximizing the CPU, maximizing the memory, and then improving the I.O. that you have. And throughout, the, throughout these things, you'll see that uh, setting up, uh, I mean, optimizing on uh, server utilization was like a high priority in one form or the other. Um, so this one was about uh, memory management and CPU, like trying to ma maximize the memory and CPU within all of the services in Twitter. Uh, it's primarily optimized, uh, cache optimization happened here. And the next was parallelizing the workload. Uh, that was done using the Unicorn framework, which was still on Ruby on Rails, and we are still on Ruby. And then along the way, we migrated out to uh, Java-based, Scala-based uh, systems. But then, You'll see here the World Cup tweet that generated a blog post. So every blog post 
that used to get generated that time was about like why we failed, this is how we failed, and this is how, this is what we are doing to fix. And uh, we kept going on in terms of trying to improve, improve the platform and improve the utilization of the servers. So um, the user base still kept growing, and then uh, we grew out of capacity on our colo. So we did uh, move to our own data center. And it started off in July of 2010 with a plan. And, uh, and a year and a little over a year, I think we did uh, we did a really smooth migration over to the data centers. So this one, I mean, as the user base kept growing, it kept outpacing the way, rate, pace at which we were uh, improving the platform and then improving the applications that run on the platform. And uh, by this time, we were we are like way into building fine grained services, and then. Each fine-grained services that you build is going to have the same set of problems in terms of scaling and scale management. And uh, we did build Finagle, and uh, it's now open sourced. So uh, that's a that's an RPC framework which abstracts away all your problems for dealing up dealing with uh, uh, scaling your services, right? whether it's supplying back pressure or. Uh, um, talking to another service, or trying to find out where your next service is located. So all those problems are dealt with at Finagle. So um, while this was still happening, um, and trying to make, applic uh, trying to make uh, writing services easy, writing uh, services be more scalable, we were still constantly obsessed about how to maximize the utilization on servers. So the next, bi next big change that happened in Twitter was uh, Mesos. So now you get a relocate, relocatable workload, uh, which is called containers now. So I think uh, it's a term that now many people are familiar with, and many people associate with uh, utilization of server. But uh, it was primarily to facilitate workload migration at that time. And it's a pretty good hardware abstraction that uh, I think many people now know about. So that. Uh, so all those things happened, and now, uh, now we have a large fleet of servers, uh, several hundred thousands of servers. And uh, I think more than 40%, more than I think, run, uh, run our Mesos cluster. So this, is, this keeps expanding, and then we'll, uh, we, we'll still keep expanding on the server capacity, but we'll still keep working on optimizing our uh, platforms and infrastructures that support uh, support running services. And the, this is the other example where we have uh, Heron, which is a highly optimized stream processing engine. And uh, we recently released an uh, open source version of this. So what you'll notice is like the primary objective for hardware infrastructure is maniacally uh, optimized for cost. Like, find the cheapest possible processor, find uh, cheapest possible hardware, and make it more be available and more efficient. And uh, for platform infrastructure, the uh, primary objective that they optimize towards is uh, keeping the SLAs up, like trying to build the multi-tenant systems, trying to optimize, trying to make sure that uh, it runs on any kind of flaky hardware. and. Uh, that's their primary objective for platform infrastructure. An application framework will heavily optimize towards making the developer productivity higher, like however way they can. So you'll find this as a theme. And doesn't mean that each function just sticks to that, but that's their primary objective with which they, uh, they drive their organization. So there are a lot of definition about fine-grained service model, but I'll try to give my version of it. Um, when you start off with a monolithic service and try to break it down, your expectation is uh, sort of like you'll get a really clean interface, and then uh, it'll sort of appear like this, where you can actually talk to each, uh, the services talk to each other, and everything is understandable and uh, uh, clean. But what you really end up with is this. Um, you're going to get thousands of services, uh, each talking to each other. And you're going to have to manage this um, mess in one form or the other. So there are tools that will get built. There is cataloging system and everything that will get built around the, around just to manage this complexity now that we have created because of micro because of fine grained services. But 
But this is essential, of course, for improving resiliency, improving developer productivity, and then uh, um, I, I think that needs no explanation now. I think many of you are familiar with that. So uh, how do you break a, break a service into, what are the principles that you use? Um, obviously, you can go crazy and then make every function call uh, service, but it needs to be broken down into like, borrowing from uh, the genius. So uh, it's a service, services should be broken down to a granularity that's as fine as possible, but no finer. Uh, and that's a hard line to draw. And I think everybody who has done microservices would have gone through this iteration in their org in one form or the other, like how where do I break the services down? So uh, the, some of the principles are like isolation and security boundary is one thing that you'd have to really pay attention to. So if there is a, if there is a service and that deals with the data that you wanted that service to deal with, uh, that, that should not leak into other services. So you should contain uh, any part of services that deal with some part of data that you think needs to be isolated and kept, needs to be in a single service. So you don't, uh, you would want to break them into multiple services. Then you'd have to deal with like resource permissions and granting permissions between these services. That's going to be harder. Um, when you like take a when you take a big code base and then you try to walk through, uh, debug through your performance, you're going to identify like some hot spots in the code, and uh, you can easily at that time say that that's a piece that needs to be broken down into a service, so that can be independently scaled regardless, of, without having to worry about the scale on the uh, outside services. So that's one thing that I think uh, uh, it's an easy one for people to think through and then understand that that needs to be broken down. Uh, but you do, I do see a lot of people tripping around uh, the isolation and security boundary. I think that's like one of the hard, harder problems. Um, the other thing that, ne that we need to pay attention to is fault localization and isolation. So fault localization and isolation are two different parts of the same problem. The effect is uh, isolation. The, uh, the stress is like the impact, the thing that you do is like localization. So any fault that you do, you'd have to like consume, uh, consume it within your service and then uh, respond in a way that you don't actually fail the calling service or if you call a service and then you detect like some error and then you'd have to like gracefully shut down and fail. So you'd have to try hard to keep your faults local. For us, Finagle as a framework provides that ability like quite a bit. So we rely on Finagle quite a, quite a bit on that. So uh, I, we won't touch upon chargeback, but there is like one thorny problem in chargeback that uh, anybody who has dealt with cost, cloud, uh, or their CFOs and their organizations would uh, agree to. TCO is hard. So regardless of how you frame it, regardless of how you approximate it, it is a hard problem. Um, when two, a couple of years back when we started, uh, started this project, um, it was a very abstract thing to deal with, however way you deal with it. So we did like a uh, rough, assumption for TCO to even figure out if it's a chargeback as a worthwhile project to go about. And then uh, we put together trying to find out uh, the total cost for what we would end up saving if we did chargeback. This is, and this is not used in uh, current TCO model uh, yet, but a version of uh, some form or some, some version of this is to the Multi-tenant infrastructure that supports, uh, I mean, multi-tenant infrastructure is key to supporting fine-grained services. Without multi-tenant infrastructure, fine-grained services is like almost pointless. I mean, I guess you could use like a fine-grained service on like a really uh, non-multi-tenant service, but you don't get the identification or you don't get the identity propagation over to uh, the platform services and then uh, like tracking, auditing and everything becomes harder or even charging back becomes harder. So uh, proper layered multi-tenant system is something that would have a full-on hardware infrastructure that has the container and a VM and RPC, uh, supported by RPC and you build platform APIs off of the RPC framework. And then you have an application API that you build on top of platform APIs that you can expose to uh, the end user apps. 
And if we are living in this world, the talk ends here, and then we are all happy. <laughs> but uh, the variations in layers is like quite quite a bit. I mean, quite complex. So you'd find like some infrastructures that are running on RPC framework powered by platform APIs. Some are running in containers uh, without RPC framework, but it'll just use a platform API. And then there are platform APIs that'll be built directly on top of uh, hardware. Like, these are called dedicated services in our world, but uh, you have a you have, uh, variety of this, and now you have to deal with. I mean, you cannot now localize your problem of uh, service identity to just either the finagle framework or container. So now you'd have to understand all layers of stack and how you actually propagate the identity for like varying uh, types of uh, multi-tenant infrastructure and how you, uh, how you identify them, how you deal with them. Um, there are a few principles that, uh, that facilitate uh, proper multi-tenant neighbors. Um, and let's talk about little, little, little more about like the complexity around uh, Twitter's infrastructure itself. So uh, we have we have a lot of uh, multi-tenant infrastructures within Twitter, right? See, so each of them have their own identity, identity, way to identify clients, if they have a way to identify clients. And uh, some have strong authentications. Some are like, basically, I, I have an API, go edit, call do whatever you want, right? And authorization is inconsistent. And most of the systems don't do like a fine-grained author authorization, even if they do. And uh, that's that's an inconsistent implementation. And I, I'm guessing many many people that are going to have to deal with like polyglot of uh, multi-tenant in, uh, infrastructure are, have to go through this anyway. And rate limiting or quota management is uh, all over the map. Like some are, uh, s some know how to limit. Uh, and isolate uh, isolate the uh, rates and quota to a client, and some actually don't. Some infrastructures don't even care. So we have a plethora of uh, multi-tenant infrastructures. Uh, I mean, Mesos ha Mesos offers like m multiple offerings. Um, you have like a prod offering and a spot instances uh, type of offering, and Hadoop has its own uh, proc and cold store. So. Things like that. Each infrastructure is going to have its own way in which it's going to expose how to use those infrastructures, and uh, there are benefits in using one versus the other, just like how we would use uh, S3 or how we would use uh, Bigtable versus uh, different types of um, storage systems in uh, Google. Right. So you have you have choices to pick which ones you want, but you don't necessarily are given any guidance in terms of this is what this is how you pick each. And one of the things that happened as a result of chargeback was uh, we'd be able to provide them with a, a real cost uh, in real dollars to say, if you pick this, this is what's going to be the impact, which most, for most of you uh, working on cloud, it's given and taken for granted. Like You already know what your unit, unit prices are going to be if you do an operation. But that wasn't the case with Twitter, and then we had to build that up from ground up. So. So now you have clients which are going to be plethora of clients, like from users to platform services to app services. Um, that, I mean, given that as a complexity of uh, multi-tenant services, um, oh, it doesn't actually stop there. Uh, we have infrastructures consuming other infrastructures, which is sort of like this. So we, so these are the complexities that. Uh, that are that exist in trying to have a polyglot of multi-tenant services that are available for building on microservices. So we'll go a little bit deeper into what the security model uh, model is. And before that, I just wanted to go over the understanding of what security itself is. I mean, security is like completely overused and abused term uh, these days. At least that's what I feel. So. People use security when they want to talk about authentication. People use security when they want to say uh, authorization, enforcement. And many times, protection is completely confused for security. When you say like a system that has that's encrypted and uh, data stored at rest is a protected system, but it's not a secure system. I mean, unless you have the ability to say that the person who's allowed to access the data 
is the only person that's allowed that's accessing the data. It's not a fully secure system, right? So, and same thing with privacy and uh, security is uh, security essentially provides trust. Like you just basically trust the system. If it's a secure system, you just trust the system. You do what you are required to do, and then the the system just does what it what is the right thing for you. So, at the core of security is. Uh, service identity. So these are all tropics by itself. There is a lot of, uh, uh, like each one can have a, have a one hour talk or a two hour talk by itself. So what I'm trying to do is cut through everything to uh, get to service identity as a problem and then we can, uh, we can uh, delve down into a little bit deeper on that. Right, so, um, and I want to leave more time for Q and A, so it'll be a much more interesting conversation because I can then cater to what you want to hear, rather than giving you like a broad overview. So, service identity is one key problem. It's like the zeroth problem that needs to be solved for any security, and uh, service identity has like multiple definitions for multiple people, uh, and that's like one of those overused terms again. But at the end of it. Uh, it's just a token that enables you to do security, uh, accountability, and auditability for your entirety of the system. And that's, regardless of Twitter or any other public cloud, service identity is a problem that you're going to have to deal with uh, to know any of the services that you're writing. How do you identify them? How do you make sure that they work in a polyglot environment? And then how do you make sure you can track them uh, in a in a consistent, reasonable way. So that's one of the things I think you need uh, you need standardization uh, if you are going to be working on say any form of Identity. Uh, I think I highly encourage you to go take a look at Spiffy. That's not what we do at Twitter, but that's like close enough uh, that you can follow for your production environment that's well thought through. So, so what do we get by solving uh, identity? I mean, obviously you get security, which solves authentication, authorization, and enforcement, and accountability, which helps you solve uh, quota budget and chargeback. And it provides you auditability for compliance and transparency. So these are the things that you get by solving service identity. I'm not going to go into how you actually solve service identity. If anybody is interested, I'd, uh, I can talk about it for hours uh, with you. But, but what I want to highlight is that's one key thing that I think uh, we need to think through in terms of uh, there isn't a there isn't a complete valid exact solution uh, that's out there and at the end of it if you really understand the problem there are going to be like only two or three ways in which you can actually really solve that problem but standardizing that is something that I think uh, will help the community at large in uh, in a in a big way so. Uh, Just to give you a perspective on what what it means uh, for identity to exist in uh, multi-tenancy, right? So multi-tenancy is sort of like farmer's market. Everybody brings their own offering, and then people go buy whatever stuff that they want across. And uh, and and a good property of coexisting multi-tenant. Uh, services should basically be, it should be able to authenticate, provided you have a valid token, but it is not the thing that is going to store your user ID. Anytime any system has a user database within it, uh, then you've already like broken the contract of like a good neighboring uh, multi-tenant system. Because you now have to deal with how you, re how you do translation from one identity that, uh, that the service owns to trying to create a user account that uh, you try to map to that system, right? So you don't want to deal with that mess. And uh, the other biggest stuff is you want to externalize the policy management, externalize the authorization decision out, but 
the system should basically deal with enforcing that. So how you generate your auth token doesn't really matter, but the fact that the auth token is exist and I, it is allowed to do something is uh, is a is the logic that that should need that should exist with the multi-tenant service. And of course, maintaining QoS uh, QoS is important. It this is sort of like you. I mean, when you go buy something from farmers market, you don't actually you take your you don't give your credit card out to that person or that that person doesn't issue you a credit card for every single. Uh, store that you go to, right? So you take your credit card, your authentication happens somewhere else, and all he needs to know is uh, you have $5 in your credit card that I can use because you bought this item, right? So that is a level of, uh, that's a level of uh, loose, uh, loose coupling that you'd have to get to to, uh, to allow a really coexisting multi-tenant neighbor. So these problems need to be externally solved externally, and then the interfaces need to get uh, defined much more clear which doesn't exist right now, but I think we are, uh, we are slowly getting there. So the key takeaway uh, in this is for any large scale enterprise that you're dealing with uh, large systems of servers, you're gonna be maniacally focused in trying to maximize resource usage. And it's not necessarily minimizing, it's like trying to use the workload to provide the value at the, uh, at, at a cost efficient way, right? So, and all the hardware platform and application together will drive towards maximizing value uh, from a workload by, while minimizing cost. Uh, a good multi-tenant system is key to enabling a secure, reliable, and available infrastructure. Um, secure is different from reliable, is different from available, so we can debate about that. It's a really good topic to just uh, brainstorm on. Uh, and that is very key to enabling fine-grained services to be run on a very uh, coherent way. The most important stuff is uh, whether, it, whether you're running it on-prem or whether you're running it on-prem plus uh, one other cloud. And uh, I hate the word cloud portability. I think cloud interoperability is a much uh, more practical thing to do than cloud portability. You're not gonna be able to uh, put a function from one cloud to the other. Um, that is again, like if anybody is interested in talking, I can, talking, I can talk. Uh, but what you really need uh, to enable cloud portability is, uh, uh, again, going back to, you need like a loosely defined set of thought through protocols that can actually enable seamless functioning between your on-prem or cloud or on-prem and multiple clouds. Right? So, and ident it starts from identity then you uh, build the access management layer on top, and those all should be an external, um, externalized system com compared to like whatever your multi-tenant system is. So that's mostly what I had. Uh, I'm available for questions, and thanks, thanks for the, thanks for listening. Um, we, it's a complete infrastructure by itself. Pretty much we use LDAP uh, for authentication. LDAPs. Yeah. And service-to-service um, -service authorization, authentication is a different thing. We use uh, X.509s. X.509s for service-to-service -service authentication. Any other questions? You have more prescriptive guidelines on the granularity of what services? Uh -huh. um, <coughs> you, you can get into a prescriptive. Obviously, you don't want to convert any every function to a service. But uh, the thing that I said about security boundary and isolation of data is very critical. I think if you get that right, that most of your fine-grained services should be okay. Cool. Thank you.